Hi, today we'll be talking to Jamie Dushom, the author of Big Bang. How are you, Jamie? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. So to start us off, can you tell me a bit about your, your life and how you, you um, almost led up to becoming an author of, of Big Vape and how, how your life's influenced you entering this profession? So my, my day job is as a health reporter at Time Magazine in New York. Um, so at Time, I had been covering vaping for a few years. I, I really started covering it around 2017 or 2018. Um, and the story really just kept progressing and becoming yeah. more interesting over time. And eventually that led into writing the book. Um, I went really deep on the company Juul, which at, especially at the time I was writing the book was like the big e-cigarette company in the US. Um, but it also looks at vaping as a whole and kind of the research on how it affects health. Yep. So the vaping crisis is obviously a, a massive issue in today's society and, and the world, especially among teenagers. Can you explain some of the obstacles and challenges that young people may have when trying to quit this, this major addiction? Yeah, it's a really good question because even the vaping companies don't necessarily know how you should quit their products. I mean, they were designed as an alternative to cigarettes, the idea being that they are hopefully less dangerous than cigarettes and people can kind of wean off cigarettes by using um, e-cigarettes instead. But nobody really looked into how to stop using e-cigarettes. Like once you've, you know, hopefully made this successful transition from traditional cigarettes to vaping, what do you do then? Um, and it's a big problem because some people find them even more addictive than the cigarettes they were originally using. Um, and there's really not great research about how to stop. And do you think these big companies really care about the fact that people don't know what's going on? And do you think it comes down to greed and the fact that they only really care about money, not the, the youth's health and well-being? Yeah, I mean, I can't speak for the companies. I will say it's obviously a good business model to sell an addictive product because you have customers who are going to come back to you again and again and again. Um, if you ask companies, I'm sure they would not give that answer. But uh, yeah, I, it definitely seems like they should have done more research and should continue to do more research about how to get people off of their products, not just how to get them onto them. Yep. And, and how common is vaping among teenagers today? I mean, I know you're based in, in the States and I'm based in South Africa where the problem is, is massive. What are things like in the States when it comes to vaping among the teenage body? Yeah, I'm really interested actually to hear about your experience in South Africa because it, it seems like you're encountering some of the same issues that we have in the U.S., um, what I will say is that the latest data that's come out of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which is like, you know, the federal data that we have, does suggest that fewer teenagers are vaping now than they were, you know, three, four years ago, which is a really good sign. It seems like during the pandemic, especially um, rates went down pretty significantly. I think the latest estimate is around 10% of high school students, um, whereas that was close to a third of high school students just a few years ago. So that's a really promising sign. Um, but of course, 10% of teenagers is still a really, you know, a big group of people. Yeah. So you mentioned that you're interested in, in how it's going in South Africa. I almost think it's it's worse. I mean, from what I've seen in, in my peer body and, and my the people around me, it's it's extremely bad. And the reason being is because a lot of we have a very like party driven society here. I mean, I'm, I'm going to be honest. And for that reason, you almost people try they're drinking and, and doing all this stuff. And you're almost replacing these issues with with vaping as if it's a good thing when comparing smoking for the last 50 years, smoking has been huge. And now vaping is coming as a uh, something to replace the smoking addiction. Is vaping from what you understand worse than smoking? Is it is it equivalent to smoking? How how can you compare how bad smoking and vaping is? Yeah, it's a really good question. It's one that is still actively being researched and there's a huge amount of debate on this topic, even among scientists. Um, my read on it from having read, you know, many studies and, and interviewed many experts on this is that if you are someone who is already smoking cigarettes and you can 100% switch from smoking cigarettes to vaping, it probably is better. You know, we don't have long-term data, so it's hard to say 100% that it's better, but that's sort of what the studies suggest. But if you are somebody who either both smokes and vapes or didn't previously smoke and just started vaping as like a fun thing to do at parties or something, it's not good for you. I mean, you're, you never want to be inhaling chemicals into your lungs. Like if, if the alternative is breathing fresh air, of course you shouldn't start vaping. Yeah. The only time that it's potentially beneficial is if you were already smoking cigarettes. Yep. 
And do we really know what the effects of vaping are yet? Have there been studies to prove whether it's good or bad? Or Because I mean, I know I, I've done a quite a lot of research on this topic to try hopefully help the student body. And when it came to cigarettes as well, they only really found out recently how bad cigarettes are, which is why people started to switch. Do we really know how bad vaping could be for our, our lungs? Not in the long term. I mean, the, the studies that we have so far do suggest that vaping while not good for you is less bad than smoking. You know, it's it's not risk-free. It's never going to be risk-free, but it seems to be less dangerous. But you make a really good point. Vapes have only been available, um, you know, it, it differs depending on which country you're in, but for one or two decades at the most. So we don't really know what happens if you vape for years and years and years on end. Um, and that's one of the big outstanding questions about this industry. Yeah, 100%. And there are a few problems with vaping. So obviously one of the main problems from, from my understanding, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is one of the main problems is that the health issue, which obviously we haven't completely discovered. The other problem is you just don't look sophisticated when you're doing this sort of thing. I mean, you, you're putting the thing out, you're going constantly and, and it just doesn't look right. You know what I mean? It's like a, and for, from successful people, I mean, I'm, I'm not successful yet for the matter, but this is a podcast about success. And from what I've understood is a lot of people, when you see someone vape, they don't look sophisticated. They don't look like they're almost on, on the right path to success and on the right path to achieving their goals. How can people that are stuck to this addiction who want to quit break free from this, from this grip that vaping's almost held onto them? Mm, it's such a good question. And I wish I had a good answer, but it, it's unfortunately really hard. I mean, it's really hard to quit cigarettes. It's really hard to quit, to quit vaping. One thing that I have found interesting and that some research has shown is that it can help people... Um, to sort of understand more about how companies exploit them. <laughs> there, there's some research to show that like if you tell teenagers about predatory marketing and the ways in which customers have, or excuse me, the ways in which tobacco companies have traditionally kind of preyed upon young people, like having this information can actually make people say like, oh, I don't want any part in that. You know, I don't, I don't want to be used as a pawn by the tobacco industry. So, you know, it's a little hard to say how that will affect every single individual, but I thought that was kind of an interesting um, tactic to take if you're trying to help people stop vaping. Because to your point, yeah, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't look really cool. Um, I think vaping companies would like to think that it does, but I, I think it often doesn't. Yeah, so the, the reason I'm saying it doesn't look cool and, and there are a few different things. And, and first of all, I'm, I'm really anti-vaping. I mean, you can, you can probably tell by the way, I'm, the way I'm discussing with you, I'm like completely anti-vaping. Partly because a lot of the people I know who are close to me are doing it and want to quit and want to overcome this addiction, but they can't. It's almost a grip. And I've, sort of, I've split into three different stages, which is the one stage, which is, th this is for South Africa. I'm not sure if it differs from the States or whatever, but the one stage is people, it's a trend. It's, it's one of those things where vaping has become one of those things where the, all the popular kids are doing it. Let me do it. Let me, let me try it. Let me, you know, pull out a vape. Let me do it. And now it's come to a level from, from my surroundings where people are, don't want to do it but they have to, they, they're stuck in it. So, and now uh, hopefully by saying it doesn't look cool, saying you actually, you're much better off by trying to achieve success, trying to build a business or whatever, or trying to build connections or, or trying to rather develop or, or change it is, is more beneficial for your future. And in my opinion, what, one of the ways you can do this is by replacing it with uh, something else, which almost helps you quit the addiction. Is that also po another possibility to try, try quit by almost distracting yourself from vaping and rather replacing it with something more impactful. Yeah, I think so. Um, I actually just recently in a story I was writing, read this study that it didn't specifically look at vaping. It looked at people who use other forms of narcotics. Um, but it did find that something like switching drug use for exercise, like basically choosing a healthier yeah. habit instead of the drug habit that you have over time, you can actually like rewire your brain to swap in that better habit for the habit that you're trying to quit. Um, so I think you're, you're right on the right track of helping people kind of make a swap for this thing that they are doing and they don't want to do for something that will serve them better is a really good approach. Yeah. And you've also done a lot of research on this topic. Of course, you, you wrote your book, which is, which is amazing. Are there any other harms that particularly for teenagers that may, or that are bad that vaping almost cause? Yeah, one really interesting and again, controversial area of research is how um, using nicotine or any addictive substance when you're young affects your brain and the way that it develops and matures. There's some research that suggests, you know, if you start vaping or using any addictive product before your brain has fully finished developing, 
it can affect your mental health and your concentration and, and things like this as you age. You know, that's not totally settled science. There are definitely people who who doubt how strong that effect is. But in my opinion, it's something that you probably don't want to mess with if you don't have to. Um, you know, why take that risk kind of thing? Um, and one interesting area that has come up, I haven't done as much research in this, but it comes up a lot in conversations I have with young people in the U.S., is the environmental effects of vaping. I mean, there's a ton of like plastic and waste and trash that comes from this habit. Um, and that's actually something that I have heard um, encourages some people to stop is they don't want to be contributing so much waste to the planet when, you know, the environment has been through enough already. And when it comes to comparing the advertisement of, of vaping and tobacco products, the vapings come in, in a lot of different flavors with different lovely names with all these different flavors and, and attractive fla uh, colors and et cetera, which in my belief is almost targeted towards a teenage body. Do you see this as a possibility? Yes, a lot of people share the belief that you have that flavors were developed specifically to attract teenagers. Um, again, vaping companies will say that's not the case. They say that adults also like to use flavors and, and that is true to an extent. Um, but I think, it, I don't know exactly what the situation is in South Africa, but something kind of interesting has happened in the US where the, the Food and Drug Administration here noticed that Juul and other brands like it were getting really popular, and they started banning their flavors, but they left out disposable e-cigarettes, which are the ones that you just use until they're empty and then throw away. Yeah. And so all of those companies are still able to sell flavors. And in many cases, they're selling flavors that are, in my opinion, more you know teen friendly than anything the other companies ever sold, and they're not regulated in the same way. So it's kind of created this like limbo state a little bit where um yeah some potentially attractive to teenagers products are still freely available on the market yeah 100 percent. And, and when comparing vaping between adults and and teenagers or below 18 year olds what are the stats looking like do more adults do it do more teenagers do it from what you've seen um that is a good question i believe You'll have to fact check me on this. Um, I believe that the the like absolute number of adults who vape is higher, but at the height of popularity, something like a third in again in the U.S., something like a third of teenagers were vaping, which was really surprising because smoking rates among U.S. teenagers were almost non-existent, like single digits. So that's what raised a lot of the alarm here in the U.S. is like we'd won basically against smoking like public health have been really really successful at helping teenagers stop smoking and then in comes vaping and it, it felt to a lot of people like all of that progress was being torn away yep so we've discussed vaguely how to quit and we're going to come back to that later and we've also discussed the stats around it what is your personal experience with vaping and what is your opinion on it um, I have never been a smoker or a vapor. I, I came to this topic purely because I was interested in it. I thought it was, you know, kind of an interesting like cultural story about why it had become so popular, how it became popular when smoking was on the decline. Um, yeah, so it, it's not something I have a ton of personal experience with. I did, I bought a jewel when I was writing my book just to kind of understand exactly what it was like. And I did not like it. I found vaping extremely... Um, it's almost like if you have too much coffee and your your heart's like beating fast and you can't focus and you feel jittery, like that's how I felt. So definitely not something that I uh, that I will be doing myself. Um, you know, I think it's it's kind of a hard topic because, like I was saying before, I think if you are someone who's smoking, you know, a, a ton of cigarettes regularly, vaping can actually be something that is helpful for you. The problem is that so many people who are not smoking and so many teenagers have picked it up, you know, and, and I think there should be regulations to prevent that. Um, but it's kind of a, a, a tricky topic because there are some people who could benefit and a lot of people who won't benefit from it. So it's it's just a matter of like, finding the right way to regulate these products so that they're not causing harm and are causing benefit to the right people. Yeah, so I'm finding this very interesting because our, our opinion varies, which is almost great because we can have a conversation and bounce off each other regarding it. I mean, I'd, so, I'd love to hear if you disagree with me, feel free to say so. Yeah, I disagree a little bit because I think there are a lot of, there are a lot of different things in this world which you can benefit from in distracting yourself and helping yourself, which don't have to be destroying your lungs or, or doing all the stuff we don't actually know what's going on. But so... I'm going to ask you before we get into this, are you pro-vaping or, or anti-vaping or are you a bit in the middle and, and how so? 
I don't think it's I don't think it's as simple as pro or anti. That's the point I'm trying to make. I think, you know, to your point about benefiting yourself without destroying your lungs, the people who can benefit are already destroying their lungs by smoking. So I'm not saying that vaping is, yep. you know, safe or risk free because it's not. I want to be very clear that it's not. But if it's, you know, a slightly better thing that maybe helps somebody stop using nicotine entirely, maybe that can be beneficial. But like I was saying, you know, teenagers, anyone who didn't smoke, anybody who is smoking and vaping at the same time is probably getting no benefit whatsoever and potentially hurting their health. So I think, you know, it for me personally, and you, you and anyone can disagree with me, it's not as simple as just saying vapes are 100% bad or 100% good. I think it's it's somewhere in the middle. Yeah. So you mentioned that vaping is, is slightly better than smoking. Is it better to do the best thing for yourself or something slightly better than the worst thing? Just out of interest. I'm just I think if you can do the best thing, which is not use either, of course you should do that. Yeah. But a lot of people struggle to do that. Um and if you know, a lot of people that I've spoken to, nothing that they had ever tried has helped them quit smoking. So they just kept smoking. Yeah. My personal opinion is that if you can do something that is a little bit better and that hopefully helps you move towards not using any tobacco product at all, I think that probably is better. Um, yeah. You know, if you can go straight to using no tobacco product, 100%, you should do that. Yeah, so that brings me to my next question, which is, is there ever a time where you can't quit an addiction? Is it ever too late? Oh man, I'm a, I'm a journalist, not a neuroscientist. I'm just, ask, so I'm... No, I'm just asking, just <laughs> out of your opinion, because you, you wrote a book, I... which, is, which is amazing. So from what you've seen, it, do, you, do you believe that, that vaping is one of those things where it's almost impossible to quit? Or, or do you think I don't think it's impossible. I, yeah, I don't, I don't believe, and again, I'm not a scientist. No, I'm, no, I'm answering, I'm answering based on sort of my personal opinion and my, my read of the research, but I'm not a brain scientist. My personal belief is that it's never too late. I think, you know, with, with willpower and support and um, the right mixture of tools, I think anybody can quit. Um, it's not always easy. It, it's often very difficult, but I like to believe that it's never too late. Yeah, absolutely. So First of all, I, I love all your opinions. Very, um, what's the right word? Humble and like you, you go, you're coming into it at, a, at an angle of, of your opinion, how you almost see it from, from your angle in, in the States. And it's very different from my angle in South Africa. I'm going to change the topic a bit to your book. Can you tell us a bit more about the Big Vape book? Sure. So the book um, really, like I said, focuses on the company Jewel. It traces it all the way back to the very beginning when the two founders met at Stanford and came up with the idea for the company, um, which was all the way back in, in 2005, and then traces you know, their pursuit from this for having the idea to actually building the product, getting it on the market, um, to when teenagers started using it and there started to be a massive amount of pushback against Juul and now to where they are today, which is a much, much smaller portion of the market, heavily regulated, um, you know, pretty widely seen as having purposely addicted teenagers. And then throughout the book, which, um, which is, like I said, focused on Juul, it gets into the research on vaping, other companies, you know, people's experience with using the products, the way they've been regulated. Um, so yeah. And it will also be a Netflix series that's coming out in the U.S. Oh, wow. this fall. Oh, well, well, congratulations, <laughs> first of all. Thank you. <laughs> and you mentioned regulation. How regulated is it over there in the States? Because I want to compare it to, to my community here. Yeah, I was reading actually a bit about the situation in South Africa, and it seems like it's moving towards a similar direction as what's happened in the U.S., which is flavors in particular are are quite heavily regulated here. So with the exception of those disposable um, vapes that I was talking about before, companies like Juul like really can't sell flavors. They can only sell tobacco um, and I believe menthol, um, menthol like pods. And it's become much harder for people to buy them underage, which is a good thing. Um, but they're still widely available. I mean, you can go into pretty much any convenience store or, or gas station and you'll still see them for sale. Yeah. So I'm going to go back to what you mentioned earlier on in your book regarding the guys and how they started the the company from, from Stanford. What was their target for, for starting the vapes? Was what, what was their target when it came to the, the company from what you've seen? Sure. So they were both smokers and the founders are, are James and Adam. They had both been smokers. They had both struggled to quit 
And their idea was essentially to create something that captured the good parts of smoking, which as they saw were um, like the, the routine and the habit of it and the sort of the social benefits of like stepping outside to have a cigarette break with other smokers. But they wanted to capture those things in a product that wasn't as dangerous. So that was sort of the idea that they launched with. Um, interestingly, when they started, it, it wasn't necessarily that they wanted to help people quit smoking. They just wanted to kind of shift people over to something that was less dangerous, which um, gets at what I was saying before. Like there was no research about how to quit vaping because that wasn't necessarily their goal at the very beginning. Yeah. And are there any myths, myths surrounding vaping that you frequently encounter when, when, that you encountered when, coming, when writing your book? Any myths? I need to think about that for a second. Um, I mean, I think there's a huge amount of disagreement about how good or bad vaping actually is. I don't know if that counts as a myth, but it's something that I find really interesting about this story is that, you know, you can find scientists who passionately believe that vaping is life-saving. And you can find scientists who passionately believe that vaping is just as bad as smoking and it's it's going to kill everybody who does it. Um, so again, I think, I think it's, it's difficult to know exactly which side is right, because there is research to say both things. Um, but it's something that I just find interesting ab about this story is like the science is evolving in real time. And we're all kind of learning about it as millions of people do it. Yep. And, and from the beginning of when vaping came out to, to now, what has changed when it comes to regulating the, the sales of vaping from what you've seen? Well, in the U.S., at least, when vaping started, there was no regulation. You could essentially, uh, if you had enough money, you could just launch a vaping company. Uh, you didn't have to apply for approval from the Food and Drug Administration. You didn't have to do studies on your product. You could just start selling it, um, which is, you know, in my opinion, a problematic system. Now there is more regulation. Um, if you want to start a new vaping brand in the U.S., you have to do studies and submit applications to the Food and Drug Administration. And there's an actual review process to say, you know, if your product is safe or less dangerous enough to be sold in the U.S., which is a step in the right direction. Um, I'd be interested to hear, though, about how that compares to South Africa, because I know it varies quite a bit from country to country. It's completely illegal here for anyone under 18 to to even buy a vape regarding um, whether you're dealing with health issues or mental health, whatever. It's, it's completely illegal. Can under 18s actually vape then if they're, if they're dealing with this, this health stuff? In, not in legally. Not legally. I mean, what I will say is it's not terribly difficult. Like I see teenagers on the street vaping all the time. So clearly, clearly it happens, but it's not legal. And, and do you think the government as a whole is pushing to stop this vaping of underage or, or they're just sort of leaning back and leaving it and worrying about the not bigger issues, but, but other issues that they're focusing on? I think they tried very hard to stop it, especially, you know, around 2018, 2019 was kind of the peak of teenage vaping here. And there was a massive amount of government effort to stop that. You know, they were you know, talking about it all the time and pushing out all these different regulations and trying to rein in the companies that sell e-cigarettes. Um, definitely during the pandemic, I think attention shifted off of that because attention at all, <laughs> everyone's attention basically shifted to COVID for a period of several yeah, years. 100%. And now, as I was saying, the, the rates have gone down a bit, which is a good sign. Um, so it's it's not quite the like everyday public health issue that it was a few years ago but i still think it's it's a priority definitely to get underage users away from vaping yeah okay and are there any particularly memor memorable or impactful stories or incidents that you came across while researching and writing the big vape hmm. also a good question i mean i think i i find it horrifying to to hear from teenagers about how big vaping was in their schools like just the fact that you would go in the bathroom and like every stall was occupied by people vaping. That's hard for me to wrap my head around because e-cigarettes, I guess, were a thing when I was in high school, but but not popular. It was like I had never seen one in, when I was in high school. So it's really hard for me to imagine just it being so widespread in high schools, especially because nobody, not nobody, but very few people that I knew as a teenager smoked. So it, it's just a really difficult thing. Um, for me to imagine and, and probably you have more first-hand experience with this than i do yeah i mean i do, I do have more first-hand experience so i'm trying to trying to make this podcast so hopefully 
not put an end to it, but try just educate people on, on how it's bad and and the stats behind it, etc. And which is why, I've, which is for the most part why I've started this podcast. As I mentioned before, before we started recording, it's uh, putting into three categories: the ones trying to achieve success, the other ones adventure stories, the other ones trying to stop things from crushing your success. And and as I mentioned earlier as well, is not only is it bad for you, but also it creates this reputation of of you, you're a vapor, you, you're addicted to, and it is a substance. It's, it can be seen as substance abuse. You, you agree with, you agree with that, right? Oh def- yeah, definitely. Nicotine yeah. is an addictive substance. Definitely. hundred percent. And I don't, I think in general, if we're comparing it to other substances like smoking or even worse weed and, and drinking and all this sort of stuff, it's none of the other substances are a positive thing, which is why, which is why I find it so weird that in a world where it's been labeled as a health thing, but now it's also a substance. I, f- I find it crazy how they've been able to, I'm not going to say manipulate, because as you mentioned, it's a, it, it may have certain um, positive aspects of it, but I find it crazy how they've almost put a spin on it, which is making it seem as a positive thing to all these teenagers, almost brainwashing them into, into doing it. Do, do you agree with what I'm saying here? I think there has definitely been an evolution in how much people understand about vaping. I think when it first started to get popular, a lot of people that I spoke to, and especially teenagers, didn't realize that what they were inhaling was addictive. They thought it was like flavored water vapor, essentially, and that it was harmless. And now I think people understand a lot more that it's not harmless and that it is addictive. And I think you know, you were asking me about how, um, how to quit vaping. I think that was kind of a light bulb moment for a lot of young people that I've spoken to is like, we were sold this thing as though it was harmless and it's not. And and now I feel kind of like taken advantage of, and I don't want to give these companies my money anymore. And you know, that realization is not always, that's that's the issue. Right. That realization is not necessarily enough to, to break an addiction cold Turkey, but I think it is the first step towards like wanting to quit, which is important. Yeah, no, hundred percent. And it's almost an issue of people started doing it thinking it was healthy, but now they've been hooked in this thing, and now they don't have a choice. It's like, what must I do? I either going to be craving it and dying at home for, from wanting to pick up a vape, looking for it all over the place. I mean, I've seen people literally freak out over not having a vape, which is it's it's a huge problem. And you either spend money on not freaking out and and thinking it's okay, or you freak out. And and people obviously take the route of of trying to trying to buy this vape and trying to um carry on their addiction because they can't help it it's, it's it's almost like they're trapped in a, a spell per se trying to trying to quit so i'm, I'm going to change the topic more from the the addiction side and, and the effects of it and i'm going to ask you are there any developments or updates in the world of vaping that you, our audience the, the teenagers in particular should be aware of well i think and again i i'm sorry that i'm so u.s focused but that's that's the that's area fine. that that's i fine. know the best yep. i think it's really important for teenagers to understand that a lot of the single use like disposable products are not closely regulated at all. Um, so it's, it's, it's a little bit of a like wild west out there in terms of what can be sold. I think that's really important to know. Um, and yeah, I just, I think it's important to keep an eye on the research and and see what is actually known about vaping and how that evolves over time. Yep. So before I get into the next the next topic, um, as we close off the the um, episode of the podcast, I'm going to ask you: Is are there anything that you would say to to teenagers? That, I'm going to create a hypo- hypothetical situation. Let's say you had a kid and and they were vaping. So you had a kid, they were vaping. What would you tell that kid? I would tell them that vaping, again, if they were not a smoker, which I'm assuming a teenager is not. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, yep. Um, I yep. would tell them that vaping offers them absolutely no benefit and potentially quite a lot of harm. Um, I would tell them that this is a habit that might seem harmless and like a fun thing to do at parties, but it could potentially stick with you for your entire life. Um, and, you know, that's not something you probably want to mess with. It's it's a potentially very expensive and damaging and and to your point, like psychologically difficult habit to carry with you. So it's it's better to just never start. Yeah, hundred percent scale. So I'm gonna I'm gonna move on, and I ask all my guests from day one last year December. I've I've asked them these questions. What is your personal definition of success? Such a good question. Uh, my personal definition of success is living a life that makes you happy. That can look like many different things, but I think a life that makes you happy and and that allows you to wake up every day feeling as though you have some kind of purpose in the world. And I, yeah, like I said, I think that can look a million different ways, but that's the most important thing in my opinion. 
Yeah, and you mentioned the word purpose, which I think is probably one of my favorite words, and it is one of the ways you can quit these addictions. And and I, I was very naughty in grade nine. I'm just gonna say that now. And I, I never vaped or did any of this stuff because I knew the consequences behind it from from a young age. But a purpose is what gave me this sort of link to try stop this this stuff and try rather than being naughty, try rather achieve success. H- have you achieved your purpose? Uh, and are you still going? What's the next step in your path to continue achieving this success, which you've described as happiness? I think, you know, I'm, I'm quite proud of the work that I have done um, and continue to do in my job. I, I write about health and science, and I think that's yep. a topic that matters to a lot of people. You know, we all hopefully to some extent or another care about our health. So it, it does bring me a sense of purpose to convey that information to the public. Um, but, you know, I think I think it's a lifelong journey. I have a lot of life left ahead of me, and I, I hope to do a lot more with the years that I have. And who knows, maybe my definition of success will evolve as I do. But for now, I think I'm on the right path, which is Amazing. a good thing. I, I would think the same thing if I was you, I must be honest. So to, <laughs> thank you. To, to end us off, if you could go back and say one thing to your 16-year-old self, what would that be? Oh, you're asking such good questions. Um, I would tell my 16-year-old self not to worry so much um, and to trust that things will unfold as they are supposed to. I was very stressed when I was a 16-year-old about going to the right college and getting the right job and all of these things, you know, quote unquote, what I should be doing. Um, and some of those things didn't work out the way that I thought they would. And that turned out to be fine. You know, life life has a way of, of working out if you want it to and if you work for it. Um, so I tell my 16 year old self, you know, continue working hard and, and doing the things that you want to do, but also take some time to just relax and be a teenager. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you so much. And I really do appreciate this. I, I'll try to spread the podcast to as many people as possible and try spread the word about vaping. So thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the great conversation. Thank you for listening to that episode of Greater Podcast with Jamie Ducharme on vaping. See you next time.